church, our, if we're in a boat, our boat's leaning this way a little bit. We have to have some volunteers. It's okay. It's okay. Wow, y'all made it through the heat. You're surviving the drought. Do we need a, do we need a um, t-shirt for this year for the drought? I survived the drought. Hey, Jay. All right. I know, it's not over yet, is it? Sure not. Well, this is a great day, and we're happy to be here today, and we have our missionaries, so we're going to hear from them. They're going to be our message. We had uh, Filipino from the uh, Filipino, so that was awesome. So we're looking forward to hearing from him and meeting Lisa, and it's going to be a great time. Somebody that some of you guys have been supporting for quite some time. We had a good interview over at Fellowship Hall. We had tons of fun. We had our uh, Clay Slayer Fellowship. And, of course, Chandler won, but Chandler should always win, right, Chandler? You're the competitive shooter. If you don't win, then, we, you know, there's something wrong. So I came in big time second, and we had a, t a tie for third place between Larry, Tom, and uh, Bob. So that was kind of fun. We had a good time. We had a lot of fun. So that if you guys haven't ever shot shotguns with us, y'all need to come do that. That's a lot of fun if you ever do that sort of thing. Fifth Sunday Sing that we were going to have down here is going to be back down at the Methodist Church. We had some logistical challenges, so we're not doing that here tonight. August the 5th, Friday, that is an opportunity. We are going to have international potluck dinner. So whatever kind of food that you can cook from somewhere else, bring it on. We're going to do that at 6 p.m., and we're going to play games and eat. We've got Italian, Indian, and a couple of people are doing German. We have Mexican. Uh, we have Mexican. Mexican? Ooh. Who's bringing the Mexican? Uh, Wanda. <laughs> oh. And then Jamaican. All right. So we got some real opportunity. Y'all need to, if you're a Baptist, you need to get up here and eat. That's what we do. That's what Baptists do, right? Baptists eat. In the name of Jesus. Eat in the name of Jesus. Greek. All right. Good time. Greek. Oh, Greek yeah. food's hard to beat. All right. Good times. We've got a lot to look forward to and a lot to look forward to today. We've got our grandkids with us and get things going on. Be in prayer for our people. COVID's kind of come through the congregation again. People take turns getting it. And I think most of our people are over it. Uh, Schmitz may be a little bit, still kind of hanging on a little bit. So let's pray and get started. Father God, we thank you for the day. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. Thank you for their, um, this couple that has committed their life to taking the gospel uh, someplace very far from here, Lord, and, and taking the gospel under certain circumstances that can be sometimes challenging. Bless them and let us have ears to hear and eyes to see as they share that testimony with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's all stand. We're singing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. <coughs> Kids, too. Let's make sure we're on the right note. Okay. It sounds like um, your violin duel is off. See if duel is on. Yeah. Duel's on. It is on. There it is. I'll just turn it down here for this one.
guys sound like a thousand person choir. Can we have our ushers come forward? Father God, again, it's a privilege to be in your house, to worship you, to just reflect on the way that you've blessed us, watched over us, kept us safe. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for uh, this missionary couple that are here uh, to lead us in worship and to share uh, with us uh, just their lives and, and how you've worked in their lives. Uh, we just pray that the offerings that we have today uh, are used to further your kingdom and again we're just so blessed and thank you for uh, how you've loved us and provide for us in Jesus name Amen, Amen.
the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Our scripture today, we'll look at the Great Commission and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I have commanded you. And behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay, we're going to stand for our last song, Easter Hallelujah. This is the one that we sang. So everybody stand. This is the one that we sang at Easter. It was resurrection and happy good lyrics put to the uh, Leonard Cohen Hallelujah song. And Coco is going to join us. And no, he is not a drummer. He just has natural ability and been, been work, working with it today. And he's done really well. So. Drum. Yeah, his dad was my drummer before. So um, when we were at other churches. So you can say a little prayer for Coco because... This is his first time to ever do anything like this, right, Coco? Yeah. All right. We are plus four, mm -hmm. and you went to 351. Okay, here we go. I'm pressing my first note. Press your C chord. Okay. And just turn that. Can you turn that down just a hair? Yes, ma'am. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's go just a little bit louder. Louder? louder? And just a tiny bit, yeah. Okay, good. Sing with me. There was a time upon the earth, God walked with men full of joy and mirth, but Adam's straight and dark.
seated. All right, Dylan keyboards and Coco on drums. Good job, Coco. So, yeah, good job. It's his first time ever to do that. His daddy had the natural drumming ability, and the only way for me to save my house was to find a pair of drumsticks and a drum, so he quit beating on everything else, because all he did was walk around hitting stuff with sticks. So we, uh, we, we unearthed that gift pretty quickly, and his sons inherited it, so that's a blessing. That's good times. Well, um, one thing that we can be proud of our denomination is that it's very strong in missions. And our church is very strong in missions. We've directly supported missionaries. And we have one of those, that couple here today, one of those couples here. And that's an amazing thing. And um, we have a lot to be thankful for in that. We've got a lot to be proud of. And we really look forward to hearing from Phil and Lisa. And Phil, I'm going to go ahead and have you come up here and... The amazing thing Phil said to us in Sunday school, and correct me if I'm wrong, that your parents were led to the Lord by BMA missionaries, correct? And so he's, uh, he benefited from BMA missionaries and now is a BMA missionary. What an amazing uh, testimony, right? You know, we, we just we think about what we do. And we wonder what kind of impact we have. But when we're faithful to God and we do what God's called us to do, there's that generational ripple effect that just goes on and on. You, just, you really can't measure it. It's immeasurable. Paul said at the end of his life, he said, I don't even judge myself yet. And, and we, you know, it's true for the things that we wish we hadn't done, but it's true for the things that we do for the Lord that they're, you know, the benefits are immeasurable. So Phil, you come up and share with us. And brother, thank you for being here. And after we, uh, after he's done, we're going to go together to the, the one restaurant in town and we're going to feed them. So if y'all want to join us for lunch, let us know. Aloha. Aloha. And Mabuhai. So good to be back here. You know, I came here with a tie, and then the, so, uh, Pastor Prince said that wear a tie, you can always layer down. And so I took my tie off. I said, I'm going to wear what I usually wear when I preach. And you know, I first came here many, many years ago, uh, close to 20 years. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I was, uh, I'm still a missionary to the Pacific Islands. And so I'm wearing a Hawaiian kukui not lay, but in acknowledgement to the hospitality of this church that you have been accorded to us this many years, we are going to bestow a lay to a representative of your church, but instead of a lay of flowers, it's going to be a lay of pearls. Because now I'm a missionary to the Philippines, the Pearl of the Orient Sea. So the lay of pearl will be given to Miss Joanne Marsh, Mrs. Joanne Marsh. Don't go to the pawn shop. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Well, the picture will show you how we started as missionaries to the Philippines. When we first came here, that was uh, about 2005, and Dr. McCann said, come in, uh, because we were having a hard time trying to raise money to go to Hawaii, because people didn't think that was a legitimate mission field. But, you know, it's not a walk on the beach when you uh, plant churches in Hawaii. But thank you for helping us with your prayers and your support all through these years, even, even today, you've been helping us. So we didn't have a, a car when we started in the Philippines that, uh, you know, because I speak the language, I hear these people talking about, what is this American lady uh, walking everywhere with her grocery bags? Where's her husband? Doesn't she have the American dollars to buy a car? I heard it. And so I bought the Cadillac of a shopping cart. And so here we were. Let's roll. So my wife is helping me at the back with the PowerPoint. And so next frame, please. Uh, we will start with uh, the reading of our sermon because my presentation will transition into the message and it's taken from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Follow along with me. And a reading from the Gospel of John chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. It reads, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias 
And on this wise showed he himself. They were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. What a miracle this is. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you. May the Holy Spirit touch hearts. If there's anyone here who needs to come to have a personal relationship with Christ, may today be the time. May you gift that person with a gift of faith and repentance. And today might be the beginning of a new day. A life uh, leading on to eternity in heaven. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. We glorify the name of Jesus. May you answer the prayers spoken and unspoken. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the title of our message is based on um, the, the message where Jesus said, Children, have you any meat? Well, you can see that the disciples were younger men, definitely younger than me. So he's like, he was not being disrespectful. He's just saying, boys who are on the job, did you catch any fish? He's using a, a, a phrase or a word in Greek that can be a substitute for fish. So the title of our message today, Got Me, or Have You Caught Some Fish? Well, let me begin with my story. How did I become a missionary? Well, of course, to become a missionary, you've got to come to know Jesus first. And so I came to faith because you, the Churches of the Baptist Missionary Association, sent the first missionary to the Philippines. That was in 1974, Travis and Karen Moore. Karen was expecting this little boy and not knowing where she was going to deliver the baby. She did in the Philippines and they started a church in my neighborhood. Of the 7,641 islands in the Philippines, they landed on my island and planted a church in my neighborhood, knocked on our door. And that's how they, my parents were led to the Lord, including myself. And this is the church. The missionary left to come back to America, and I pastored the church. He passed the baton to me, and they just celebrated, uh, I think now, 48 years. Instead of a turkey right there, it's very traditional, cultural, that you have to have a roast pig. So that's why they have this big pig right there uh, to celebrate their anniversary. Well, uh, my mother was very resistant to the gospel. Because she, she taught me that religion was the way to heaven. And we have our favorite saints that, well, this is a story. I would, of all the children, I was the one that would uh, go with her to church. Uh, as soon as we entered the door of the church, we would get down on our knees and walk on our knees to come to the altar. But we would also stop at every pillar of the church where there is our, uh, a statue of the saints and uh, idols and so we would worship those idols because that's how we would get to heaven according to uh, what we learned from our ancestors well this missionary said no that's not the way to heaven only one way can take you to heaven the way the truth and the life no one cometh unto the father but by him John 14 6 well I resisted the Holy Spirit just like my mother did my mother eventually got saved in the hospital room, she invited the same uh, missionary that she kicked out of the house because, you know, she didn't like the gospel. But he led her to the Lord. Well, I too resisted the gospel, but during college, we went on a college trip and I drowned. The college professor that was with us revived me with CPR. And you see, I was uh, an accident prone and I wrecked my bike the first day I got it. But nevertheless, the Lord saved me, and I'm so happy. 
I heard the gospel, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a beautiful verse, I thought. The gospel in a nutshell. Okay, so the Lord called me to preach, and so I went to our seminary in Jacksonville, Texas, and later on, I went to Dallas Theological Seminary, also in, here in Texas. My father was living in California then, and so I would spend time with him, and that's how I met my wife. Is there a picture? Yes. So we got married in Oregon because she's from Oregon. We got married in 1988, just a year before your pastor and uh, his wife got married. You see, during our reception, we have this map of the world because we presented ourselves to be the next missionaries to the Philippines. It didn't happen because the mission office did not accept our application, uh, denied us. We even have a picture of uh, where we got married in Eugene, Oregon with the ribbon from Oregon to the Philippines. It didn't happen. But that ribbon draped over the Pacific Ocean, over the Hawaiian Islands. Guess what? If I cannot go to the Philippines, I go to a place where there are tons of Filipinos and the number one ethnic group in Hawaii is Filipino. And so I went there, but during the meantime, I went uh, to, um, to help churches that had gone through church splits in California, in Oregon, and in Washington states. These are actually the sites of the churches that I pastored. And later on, after all this, I applied as missionary, and thank you for New Hope Baptist Church that believe in our vision, because, uh, you know, getting supporters is hard to go to Hawaii. So, uh, thank you. In 2005, we were elected. 2006, we went to Hawaii, where there are tons of Filipino. And they, were be they become, my family became my church planting team. Uh, there's my family. Even my daughter that got married went, went back to Hawaii to help us with our youth ministry. And there they are. And this is a picture. Uh, oh, this is from nine years ago, and this is to almost nine months ago. Now we have a new grandson. He's just a month old. So now we got two grandsons and four granddaughters. All in Conway, Oregon. The Lord bless us that we planted Ali'i Baptist Church in Eva Beach. Ali'i meaning royalty. We're children of the king. But we also expanded to the next town, Nakoa Baptist Church in Waipahu. Nakoa meaning the strong. For we are strong in the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Lord has blessed. Glory to Him. But in 2016, we moved to Hawaii. The people in Hawaii, are, the Filipino members of our churches said, why are you going back to the Philippines? We left the Philippines because of the politics, the economy, even the weather is bad. Why are you leaving? I said, because we got a calling. So we took that 10-hour flight as we uh, I requested a transfer to the Philippines. That was in 2016. You see, there's a reason why we went to the Philippines, and one of them was the people in Hawaii said, you know, our denomination has been in the Philippines for close to 50 years. How come we have not reached the northern tip of the Philippines where the Ilocano people live? I said, yeah, that's a very good question. Well, let's solve that problem. Let me, let me have the names of your relatives, and we'll look them up. We even brought our medical missions from the BMA, and they've been there twice already. And as you can see, we have people uh, responding to the gospel, and we baptize them. And now we got a ministry there in the northern tip of the Philippines. We also, while we were in Hawaii, we went to Micronesia. There were Filipinos, even my roommate, live in in Micronesia, and I found him there with uh, uh, two more families or three, and so we planted a church there. They were saying there's no good churches in, Hawaii, in Micronesia. Well, stop complaining. Let's plant a church, and so we did. However, because of the situation in Micronesia, 
where their visas were not renewed because, you know, China, Australia, Taiwan, uh, America, all trying to jockey for position and China having the upper hand because they are funneling a lot more money. Somehow, the foreigners were, were asked to leave, including the Filipinos. And so for my group in Micronesia, we planted a church in that heart-shaped island of the Philippines, Panay, where I actually have my ministry. So, you see, uh, it's a stopping point, Hawaii, to all these other places in, uh, in the Philippines. Well, because I'm a dual citizen, sometimes, a lot of times, the Filipino pastor don't see a white face, you see. They don't see my passport. And so they said, well, you know, uh, we're done going to a seminar or a classroom uh, situation where we're trained how to plant a church. Can, can someone show us how to plant a church? Because we're doing the translation for them. We, we interpret for them when they preach. We network for them because they're not from here. We just want to, they to sh them to show us, not us doing the legwork for them. Well, you know, chip on my shoulder. I said, I planted a church in Hawaii. I'll show you how it's done. Warning. The Bible says, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I fell flat on my face because people were avoiding me like a plague. Here in Ilo, Ilo City, where it's a seat of idolatry, not only of the so-called Christian idols that you worship, which is the, that church building at the back, but you can also <coughs> worship the, the, it's called the feminist town, because all the saints that are worship are uh, women, and including the Giri gods, well, the goddesses, where you worship the pagan gods right there in the middle of the town square so uh idolatry is very strong but the people i cannot get over it how come the tribal it's a a place where you you have colorful festivals throughout the year you know one tribe in different provinces and there were uh, what get out of here you know uh, my wife and i they they told my my wife she's a ghost Get her out of here. I couldn't figure out why, and even the children were running away from us. Next frame, please. So I said, okay, why don't I start with someone, and, and perhaps the power of the gospel, the power of Christ can transform that person's life, and all the people will see that I have a real message. And so this is my water vendor. People buy water from him because you cannot drink from the water tap. And so uh, I said, Bobby, I'll buy water from you, and in exchange, I'll give you the, the living water. And you will never thirst. And once you drink it, the Lord Jesus, accepting by heart, then you'll have the spring of living water, the Holy Spirit, and you'll never run dry. Well, he understood what, what thirst was because he's the town drunk. You can see his bruise up on this side of the face because he would... Uh, during the weekends, he would drink himself to unconsciousness and fall on this side of the face. Even his two wives have left him because of his drinking. But he got saved. And so I told the people, hey, the person we all know, our water vendor, has gotten saved. Come and join us in our Bible study. And they said, oh, starting a church from a town drunk? Who would come to your church? He might have that scarlet letter the big letter a for alcoholic but we are all sinners for all have sin and come short of the glory of god and the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord well my water vendor got saved but the people were still avoiding us like a plague what can we do next so my wife and my daughter uh, justine we had four, right? Well, the, all the others are married. Well, she's the teen one that cannot get out of the house. <laughs> and so my daughter and my wife said, it's not a lost cause. Let's start with Bobby's kid. I want a vendor. Let them come with their next door neighbors 
and let's teach them how to speak English so they'll advance in school. You have to speak English to advance in the Philippines. Um, because that's the business language. That's the language in high school and college, not, perhaps not in early grades. And so they were taught English using the Bible as a curriculum. So as they learn about Adam and Eve, they learn about Jonah and Noah, they learn about the gospel. And during this meantime, my daughter got saved. Next. Okay, I'll tell you about uh, my daughter later. But what about Bobby? What about my water vendor? Well, you see, it's not just like Superman getting into the telephone booth and come out a superhero. It's a step. It's a, it's a process. Spot the changes from uh, this town drunk with droopy eyelids to now a bright-eyed man. And this was this a few weeks ago. You know, his kids did not leave him because he's a good, uh, he's a good father. Uh, but look, that's after church. He is a changed man indeed. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, my daughter who was ministering to the children got convicted and she got saved. I said, okay, I'm confused now. I thought she got saved in Hawaii. We baptized her in the Pacific Ocean and had to watch out for sharks. <laughs> I could not remember. I could not forget that. But she said, Dad... I was a kid, I want to be cool and, you know, but I wasn't saved. This time, I really needed the Savior. So she got saved and look, from someone who was just, didn't want to be in the mission field and, oh, I left Hawaii, I left my friends, to someone said, okay, I'm here now, I'll minister. And today, even to this day, she came, just came home after two months of ministering as a camp counselor. That's Justine. Okay, what about the children still running away from us with Lisa as the ghost lady and me? Why are they running away from me? Because it was reported that I'm a human trafficker. Well, this boy would run away from me until later on. I have a bag of crackers, right? Hey, King, his name is King because he's uh, the king of the neighborhood. Hey, King, come here. Well, he was hungry. They would only eat one meal a day, according to him, when this picture was taken. And so he said, I don't think Mr. Kakilala is a human trafficker because he doesn't even have a car. If he abducts me, according to the report, would he stuff me in the front basket or the back basket of their tricycle that goes 15 miles per hour? So he took that cracker and just like Bobby with the water, I said, I have bread of life, Jesus Christ. Amen. You take this, the Jesus Christ, and you will never be hungry again. He knew what hunger means, and he also knows what spiritual hunger means. He'd never been to a sit-down restaurant. He doesn't know what to do with a plate. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, he had bread for his stomach, bread for his soul, and he got saved. Well, King, the little boy, this is great. I need to bring my big brother. But the big brother, you know, while King is smiling, the big brother said, huh, with a hard wall behind me, brick wall or whatever that is, and the human trafficker in front of me, I'm going to stance myself. You know, he's got a scowl in his face, hair standing up. I said, chill out. I got bread for your stomach and bread for your soul, Jesus Christ. He got saved. Guess his hair came down. <laughs> the scowl came into a smile. That is his favorite shirt. I think it was his only shirt. And he's still wearing it. But he said, I'm going to bring my basketball buddies with me. And so they also got saved. They were baptized about the same time. For the meantime, the boy's father said, what's going on with the boys in the neighborhood? So, he came to investigate what's going on, and, um, and he got saved. Can I use this instead? Oh, no, this okay. this, this just got hanging. You're good. You're doing good. Okay. So, he got saved, the father, 
And so he apologized to his wife. He said, well, I'm going to leave my mistress because now I'm saved. The reason why they only eat one meal a day because he's giving his money to the mistress. He said, I, I apologize to you. I'm going to leave my mistress. And then he turned to me. I need to apologize to Mr. Kapilala because I started the rumor about him being the human trafficker. Oh. Wow! Because, because at first I said, if I find out who's the human trafficker, oh, I'm Manny Pacquiao, you know? <laughs> That's a boxer. But he's now there. Oh, my heart just melted instead of, oh, oh, yes. My heart just melted. And so, well, there's also, you know, sometimes we do the reverse. We want the homemakers to come, the adults to come, so they can bring the children but in my experience, it was the children bringing their parents to Christ. Here's the little children that came to Sunday school, and the parent says, let's follow them. Because they're, they don't have a lot of Bible knowledge. They understood, just like the little children, about the gospel, the basics of the gospel, and it was clear to them, and they got saved. And, and so what? Uh, they got saved, and Iris and Lynn said, now that there were, we are believers in Christ, we've been living in sin. We're not married. And the kids are grown up now. We need to get married and live. Oh, yeah, yippee. But I waited this long. We're not going to get married unless you give me a bling bling. And Iris, who didn't have a good job, said, well, that would delay our marriage. And Lisa said, open my jewelry box. Get her something. And she picked out this. A ring from Walmart with three diamond nets and he got a proposal there this is inside our house and they got married and then you see the the family it's in that picture they brought their aunts and uncles they brought their their yeah aunts and uncles their grandmothers and their neighbors that's how you start a mission work I guess in the Philippines <laughs> I didn't know that but the Lord helped me to do that to realize that children are a big key to the mission work and so it's like in bowling even a little child can is capable of making a strike but it's not really the ball it's not just the missionary doing all the work in bowling it's the other pins knocking down other pins so that's how neighbors bring neighbors to Christ. That's how families bring other families to Christ. That's how friends bring their friends to Christ. And that's how starting a mission work from the town drunk as they scoff and mock. Guess what? Only the Lord can do that. Amen. And thank you for the gift that you have given us to allow us to be in the mission field because it's truly the gift that keeps on giving from one island to the next. So what do I do? Well, I did, uh, I was a church planner. Now that I'm becoming like the grandpa, you, you disciple change makers, which is a ministry of the, the BMA. This is not a typographical error. That's how it's branded, change makers as one word. A ministry of multiplication, where I started with my next door neighbor growing up. Now my next door neighbor is discipling this new, new pastor. But we, the disciples, multiply like, you know, from my next door neighbor, one. Now we have a dozen, and it's multiplying. I go there every, well, you know, I'm, I'm leaving in about uh, 10 days. And uh, they gather all this, not everybody, of course, but uh, the key people. And I'm at the head of the table like uh, their great-grandfather to minister to them. What a wonderful ministry that is. Now, an update on our family. My, my wife used to live in the Philippines. Now she cannot because she has hydrocephalus. Well, uh, the adult skull is no longer pliable, and so it doesn't expand to adjust to the amount of water in her brain. She has a lot of water in her brain. Her ventricles are a lot larger than that, and so she has massive headaches. And so she had to have a shunt. In the next frame, you will see the kind of shunt that she has, uh, which is like uh, Linda McCann. Uh, not exactly the same model, I don't think. 
So uh, my wife has that. So she cannot be in the Philippines, but she ministers uh, wherever she can. And, and so that's a prayer request. Where's the beef? Now, let's close this out with a sermon. John 21, verse 5, where Jesus said to the disciples, He was on the shore when the disciples were on the boat. He said, Children, have you any meat? Do you have any fish? Did you catch me some fish? Seasoned fishermen they were, and they said, No. Remember the Wendy's commercial? I think this was Wendy's. Well, Clara, that's the name with the phone, complaining to the manager. When they opened the big hamburger van, only seeing a teeny weeny hamburger patty inside, she hollered the famous zinger, Where's the beef? Seems like the Lord is alluding to the same question to us. Believers in Christ, where's the meat? Where's the fish? Did you bring me some fish? What seems to be the problem? These are seasoned fishermen. What is the problem? Do you think the problem was the fishing boat? I don't think so. Because the boats there in the Sea of Galilee or Sea of Tiberias, that's the same place, were built to withstand the surprise storms that would come because it's like a bowl. It's like swirling around, the wind swirls around, and all of a sudden you have a massive uh, turbulence in the, in the lake. And boats were built to withstand that. This is probably the same fishing boat that James and John's father, Zebedee, used. But it did not break up. Even during the time when Jesus walked on the water, where they were tossed back and forth, the ship was intact. Do you think the problem was the fishing boat? No. The fishing boat is symbolic of the New Testament church. You see, there's nothing wrong with the doctrines of the New Testament church. Right here, it's perfect. From Genesis to Revelation, there's no problem with the New Testament church. Our foundation is sure. The rock of the rock Jesus Christ. So the fishing boat was not the problem. What seems to be the problem? Is it the fishing net? No, I don't think so. They fish all night. Well, that's the time when it's good to, to catch a fish using the fishing net, not the fishing pole. With no sun to compete with, they light their torches and their lamp, and so they have a pool of light. And so the fish are attracted to that pool of light, and they gather around that light, and they cast their net to haul the fish. Remember, they got a net full of fish, and the, fish, and the net did not break up. The fishing net is symbolic of the gospel of Christ. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, unless you're, pre you're preaching the wrong kind of gospel. Social gospel, the gospel of good works, not the gospel of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Children, do you have any fish? Well, you can't blame the boat. You can blame the fishing there. What can they blame? The fishing hole? You see, uh, uh, last year, I believe, we were study, studying about the Bible lands and Bible locations, and we learned that the Sea of Tiberias, a.k.a. Sea of Galilee, was the supplier of fish to the nations of the Roman Empire. It was steaming full of fish. Even today, they stock it full of fish. You can go to a restaurant on the lake and order St. Peter's fish, which is actually of the family of tilapia. And it's fish from that sea, from that lake. The fishing hole was not the problem. It was full of fish. You see, I went across the ocean looking for uh, a soul not knowing that inside my home, my daughter needed to be saved. You don't need to go to Africa or South America. You need to start where you are, at your office, at your school, even in church, in your Sunday school classes, even in your home.
Children, do you have any fish? Don't blame the boat. Don't blame the net. Don't blame the fishing hole. Well, what can you blame? Is it the fishing time? Well, you see, I told you, fishing at night with the fishing net is the best time to fish. And they were seasoned fishermen. That's how they catch the fish. And in the Philippines, when they come, uh, the people were on the shore with their baskets, bamboo baskets, and asking, did you catch fish? And they come home after a night of fishing, and usually they have a boat full of fish. People get it. Especially there in the Bible time, that it's the best time to fish at night. And yet, we seem to make it an excuse. Oh, it's COVID. I can't go out. Well, uh, I'm not, I don't have time. Uh, I'm not educated yet. I haven't been to seminary. Uh, I don't have the resources to do it. I just don't have the energy. My kids are still small or I'm not retired yet. Whatever excuses that we might have, it's not the right time. Well, we think it's a good excuse anyway. But the Bible says, now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, wanting you to come and give your heart to Jesus, come. Children, do you have any fish? Don't blame the boat, don't blame the net, don't blame the fishing hole, don't blame the fishing time. Then what is the problem? The fisherman, obviously. Well, let's investigate who were the fishermen. Well, the Holy Spirit revealed to us the names of the disciples on that boat. So unmasking their identity, starting with Peter. When Jesus was crucified, he rose again from the dead, but they haven't seen Jesus for a while. So G Peter said, I'm going to go back fishing. They crucified people for preaching the gospel. I'm going back to the world that I know. Peter was on that boat. Children, do you have any fish? None. Couldn't find anything because the backslider was on the boat. The person who loved the, the world more than the Lord. Who else was on the boat? Thomas, according to the Bible, was on the boat. Thomas, Didymus, the twin. He had a twin. What's wrong with Thomas? We learn from Sunday school that he's doubting Thomas. Jesus appeared to the disciples how, after he rose again from the dead. And they told Thomas. And they said, Tom, guess who came to church today? Well, tell me. Jesus came to church. And doubting Thomas said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and feel his side where they pierce him, I will not believe. The doubter was on the boat. The backslider was on the boat. Who else was on the boat? Nathaniel was on the boat. What about Nathaniel? What were the issues with him? Well, Philip came to Nathaniel. He's also known as Bartholomew. Nate, we found the Messiah. We found the Messiah whom the prophets have told about. Jesus of Nazareth. That's how uh, Philip in, uh, introduced Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's like saying, can anything good come out of St. Elmo? No, you get offended, right? Because people make fun of your home place. Nathaniel, who's negative, poured water on the parade. He's the one that always have a bad thing to say about programs in the church or anything kind of a new activity or any kind of a, a campaign. No wonder they could not catch anything because the backslider was on the boat, the doubter was on the boat, the negative person was on the boat. Who else were on the boat? The Bible says the sons of Zebedee, we know that for sure that they were James and John. What about James and John? Well, James and John even asked their mother to tell Jesus to make them sit in the kingdom of God, to sit on the right and on the left of Jesus. They also told Jesus, Jesus, when you enter into your kingdom, can you let us sit on your right and on your left? And Jesus 
It's like telling your grandpa, Grandpa, you're not dying yet, but can I have your boat when you die? Can I have your car? Jesus was not even arrested yet, and they want the glory. They want the gain, but not the pain. They were glory seekers. They always want to have their, their names on the marquee or on the billboard for any kind of credit they can, they can get for any kind of success. Our group might have. Children, do you have any fish? None. Because the backslider was on the boat. The doubter was on the boat. The negative person was on the boat. The glory seeker was on the boat. Now, that's one, two, three, four, five. The Bible says there were seven people on the boat. Who were the other two? They were a name. How come the Holy Spirit did not give us the names of those two people? Sitting on a resource of fish and could not catch anything. Perhaps they were bench warmers. Did they hear the, the voice of Jesus saying, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They couldn't catch anything because they failed to follow Jesus. Now, how come the Holy Spirit did not reveal to us the names of the two? Because they sit in this building today. Oh, Brother Kakilala, that's just not, that's not right. Well, the message of the Bible is timeless, right? Sometimes you study the Bible and you identify with uh, whether it's David or whether it's uh, uh, Jonah or whether it's the disciples. The two disciples were you and I. We were on that boat. And perhaps it's this modern day boat that we are in. And we're looking for success and for conversions and for people to make professions of faith. And we are there. And they could not even name us because we just want to be uh, non-contributors. Children, do you have any fish? I hope and pray that in that sense of time, we'll say, Lord, I am nothing. But I did try. And just like the song says, thank you for giving to the Lord. And someone says, I am alive. That was changed. May someone use you. But you've got to start here in your heart. Do you have that? Did you drink that water? Jesus Christ, do you have the spring of living water? Do you have the bread of life? Do you have Jesus? I come here telling you thank you for all these years that you supported us in the mission field and continued to pray for us, for my wife. And now I yield the time to the pastor, Brother Chris. testimony and what an amazing challenge right we do a lot of fellowship around here we do a lot of things together but really you know in the, in the coming months I really would like to see us step back into evangelism and intentionally reach out and connect with people we've got people of uh, new people like Judy that's gone through evangelism explosion and Joanna and I that have done that three times over in three different ways and three different programs and I like for us to be very intentional about being fishers of men. We're good at fellowship. Fellowship is good, and we draw people here when we do that. But if you are willing to uh, learn to share the gospel and to join us when we go out and visit, I want to hear that this week. Email me, text me, tell me I'm available. And if you're available to go with us, we'll start going out two or three at a time, and we'll make some contacts, and we will intentionally share the gospel, which we should do. And uh, I don't have the exact text in front of me that uh, Pastor Phil had, but we also remember when Peter had been fishing all night, Jesus said, put your net on the other side of the boat. And Peter gets a little frustrated, right? He says, I've been fishing all night. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll put it on the other side. And there were so many fish that he couldn't, couldn't bring it in. It's too much. We need to just do what Jesus tells us to do, right? And we do everything that we think we know to do. But when we do what Jesus tells us to do, then he's going to give that harvest. And so I'd like to hear from you. 
Um, God's blessed us in so many ways, and we've gotten to, to bless Pastor Phil and his bride, and, and we see the numbers. We see the, the, the multiplying faces behind us and how God blessed that effort. And we've got a lot of work to do right here. I drove through the neighborhood next to me, the Admiral Shores neighborhood, and they're starting to build houses over there. There's 200 units over there, 200 properties over there of people that are coming in to live a lakeside life. That almost doubles the population of Streetman. I don't know, but <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, that's not the only place where people are moving in. I think this time last year, maybe we had had 11 new people that have moved into my neighborhood. I mean, just people are coming here. And this is a time for us to be prepared to share that gospel to connect people to Jesus and to disciple them. This is not an easy time to disciple people. The world says, I'm okay, you're okay, just leave me alone, don't step on my toes and everything's going to be all right. But people need Jesus. They need the truth. They need to know him and they need to, to follow him. And, and uh, walking with him is victory and walking any other way is harmful. It's harmful to us, it's harmful to others. And we have the opportunity to help people to see that and live that and find that joy. Uh, Phil and Lisa, would y'all come up here and we're gonna, uh, I have something for you and then the people are just gonna come greet you on the way out. Thank you so much for your testimony and everything that you're doing. Was anybody besides me encouraged by that? You know, William Carey didn't have, it was 10 years before he had one convert in India. And I don't know how long it takes to discourage you but it was 10 years before William Carey had his first convert. And before William Carey left India, the impact that he had was when he got there, when a man died, his wife was burned alive because she was considered property and was not to be passed on to another. During the time in the ministry of William Carey, that practice, which was nationally accepted and practiced, was banned. And that was the impact of one man that brought the gospel to a massive continent. We have no idea the, the impact that we can have just by being faithful. Imagine if William Carey gave up on year nine. Ministry is not always easy, but ministry is always worth it. And someday we'll have a clear picture of uh, the impact of what we do. This is a, a support check, sir, from the church, and we just uh, continue to support you in that way, and we love you guys. We're so glad that you're here. If you want to come here before the cross, well, you know what? Uh, take the seat just for a second. We, we'd be wrong if we didn't give an invitation. Y'all stand. Joanne, would you just play anything for us? And you know, the, As Phil had uh, his own family member in his own home come to Christ, in the process of ministering to others, I've known many people that the lights just turned off. They've been in a place and they realized, hey, you know, I've been around church. I've even participated in church. I've supported church. And somehow I miss Jesus. And it's time for me to nail that down. So if today's your day to nail that down, don't hesitate. Do that. It may be that you hear the voice of the Savior through our preacher today. Uh, children, where are your fish? And the truth is, is that we need to go ahead and become fishers of men again. It's very easy to get in the routine of life. And COVID taught people, you don't have to do anything. You stay home. In fact, we prefer that you do stay home, you know. And that, that's become uh, kind of a little culture that we kind of have to step beyond and kind of push through. And so if God's called you to be further committed, we can pray today. You can pray there. You can pray with me. If God has showed you that today you need him as Savior, don't hesitate. Don't wait. Make that choice today. We're going to sing, I'll come to the altar. I think y'all can remember it. <clears throat> oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.